Welcome back everyone, Houston Math Prep here. In this video, we'll explain gradients, what a gradient is, and how to calculate the gradient. When we talk about the gradient of a function, first it's important to stress that we're talking about a scalar function. In multivariable calculus, we've dealt with scalar functions where z is a function of x and y, and we've dealt with vector functions. The gradient of a scalar function at any point on the function tells us the direction of greatest increase of the function at that point. So we start with a scalar function here, some z equal to f of x, y, and for the gradient of f, we use this upside down looking triangle notation. This symbol here is called nabla, but in terms of mathematics and functions and calculus, you'll most commonly hear this called del. So we would read this as del f, and what you want to notice here is that the gradient is an operation on a scalar function, but the answer that it gives us is actually a vector function. So it takes a surface in space and it outputs a vector formula for the direction of greatest increase. And that vector has the formula where the x component is just partial fx for the function and the y component is partial fy for the function. If we're dealing with a function of three variables, so our domain is in 3D space instead of 2D space, then the gradient will still be a vector function, only it will have three components instead of two, with the final component being the partial derivative of f with respect to z. Moving right along to our first example here, we have a function of x and y, it's x squared plus y squared. We're going to find three things here. We're going to find the gradient of f, del f. We're also going to find the gradient of f at the point two comma one, and we'll find the gradient of f del f at negative one comma negative one. So the first thing we'll do here is find the gradient of f del f, and remember that's going to be partial fx comma partial fy, and our answer will be a vector function. If we take the partial derivative with respect to x of the first term, that will give us two x, and remember the partial derivative of y squared with respect to x, this would be considered a constant, so the derivative of that term would be zero. Partial derivative with respect to y now, so if we're taking with respect to y, our x squared is now a constant, that would be zero for the derivative, and the derivative of y squared is 2y. So our del f, our general gradient for the function, is actually just the vector function 2x comma 2y. So that's our first answer there. Now if we want to find the gradient at the point 2 comma 1, it's just as easy as you probably think. So taking del f and plugging in the point 2 comma 1, that's just going to give us the vector 2 times 2 for x and 2y would then be 2 times 1. So that's going to give us the vector 4 comma 2. And this answer here gives us an idea of the direction of greatest increase in our function at the point two comma one. Let's do our last one here. So our third one, we'll just do the gradient del f evaluated at negative one, negative one. If we plug in negative one for x and y here, then two times negative one will give us negative two, and two times y would give us also negative two. So you can see that when we're at the point negative one comma negative one on our function, we get a different direction. Notice we got a different vector here than we did here as far as the direction of greatest increase. Here's our function, z equals x squared plus y squared, and for any point on the surface, you can see the gradient in the xy plane below. If you imagine standing on the surface at any point, the gradient in the plane is telling us which direction to walk if we wanted to travel uphill on the surface as steep as possible from that point, the most uphill direction at that point. You might notice that sometimes this gradient has a small magnitude, sometimes it has a larger magnitude. Looking at one more example, our f of xy is now the square root of 36 minus x squared minus y squared. We're going to find del f, the gradient, and then we're also going to find del f at the point negative three comma two. So our first thing here, just finding the gradient itself, remember that is the vector with partial fx and partial fy as its components. So if we look here at this function, maybe we sort of see this, if we're doing some derivative stuff, we see this as the quantity 36 minus x squared minus y squared, 
And since it's in a square root, maybe we think of that all to the one-half power. That's what the square root is. So if we go ahead and calculate our partial derivative with respect to x then. We have an x in here, so this is not just a constant, all the stuff in here. So we'll have to do our power rule out here, but we'll have some chain rule stuff from the inside. So our partial fx, the one-half, would come out front. We'll leave the inside stuff alone, so we'll keep 36 minus x squared minus y squared. The power would go down by 1, so we'll say to the negative half. And then the chain rule with respect to x now only. So our 36 and our y squared with respect to x are both going to be constants. So really we just care about the negative x squared because everything else is going to be 0 for our derivative. And the derivative of negative x squared is going to be negative 2x. We'll clean that up in a minute. Let's do our partial fy. So again, same thing here. Really we get a 1 half coming out front. We have our 36 minus x squared minus y squared all to the power goes down by one so to the negative half and then the derivative of the inside a bit different now we're with respect to y so 36 and the x squared term are both constants in this case with respect to y so the derivative of the inside there is just going to be negative 2y and now we just need to clean up our vector a bit so here you notice we have a 2 and a 2 that'll reduce nicely and same thing here a 2 and a 2 there that'll reduce nicely so we actually get negative x and then all of this stuff to the negative one half negative means in the denominator and one half means in a square root so we're going to get the square root of 36 minus x squared minus y squared in the bottom for that one comma over here a similar thing we have negative y and then all of this stuff is to the negative one half again so we get over the square root of 36 minus x squared minus y squared again. So that's our del f for the function in general. And now what we want to do is simply evaluate this at the point negative 3, 2. So part 2, finding del f at the point negative 3, comma 2. So plugging in negative 3 for x, we'll get negative negative 3, so that'll be a 3 there over, we'll get the square root of 36 minus negative 3 squared would be 9 minus 2 squared would be 4 comma negative y, so we would have actually negative 2 here over, same thing here though in the root, right? Square root of 36 minus 9 minus 4. So if we do that, that'll actually give us 3 over the square root of 36 minus 13, which would be 23 there, comma negative 2 over the square root of 23. Our function this time is actually an upper hemisphere surface in 3D space. And over here on the right, we've plotted some level curves for the hemisphere and what the gradient will look like at any point. And if you think about standing at any point on the hemisphere, and facing the direction that would take you uphill the fastest, it's probably easy to see that you would need to walk toward the origin. So your gradient vector for this function is always pointing toward the origin for any point. In fact, what we should begin to notice is that the gradient always points normal or perpendicular to the level curves in the increasing direction. As we get closer to the origin, the magnitude of our gradient in this case is smaller because it's not as steep to walk uphill on our hemisphere. The magnitude of the gradient is much larger near the bottom of the hemisphere since we'd be walking uphill at a much higher rate toward the bottom of this surface. So not only does the gradient give us the direction of greatest increase, the magnitude of the gradient also tells us what that greatest rate of increase actually is. Let's keep that in mind as we look at our next example here. We've got a function of x and y, x squared y minus xy squared. We're going to focus on the point 1, negative 1, and we want to find these three things on this function at this point. We want to find the direction and rate of greatest increase. We want to find the direction and rate of greatest decrease. And we want to find a direction where we're not going to have any change at all, where we won't be walking uphill or downhill. So let's take a look at this first one, the direction rate of greatest increase. So we know the direction of greatest increase should be our gradient 
and it should be particularly at the point 1, negative 1, if that's what we're interested in. So let's go ahead and find that. So for the first one, our del f, which again is our partial fx, comma, partial fy. So looking at that, the partial derivative with respect to x of the first term is going to be 2xy minus the partial derivative with respect to x still of the second term now is y squared comma partial fy the partial derivative with respect to y of the first term is x squared minus the partial derivative of xy squared the two will come out the power will go down by one we'll get two xy there so that's our general gradient we want the gradient though at one negative one so del f at the point one negative one that's going to give us 2 times 1 times negative 1, which would be negative 2, minus, if we have negative 1 squared, that would be 1, comma, if we plug in positive 1 for x here, 1 squared would be 1, minus 2 times x times y, which would be 2 times 1 times negative 1, so we'd get minus negative 2, so we actually have plus 2 there. And so our gradient at the point 1, negative 1 is actually going to be negative 3 comma positive 3. So that is a vector that points in the direction of greatest increase. Now there are a lot of sources and people that will tell you when they want just a direction they don't want it as just any vector they want it as a unit vector. So a lot of times what people will do is they won't just say this is the direction of greatest increase they'll actually want a unit vector out of it and so what we'll need to do then is divide this vector by its own length. Now that's nice because we're also asked what is the rate of greatest increase? And the rate of greatest increase, that part is going to actually be the magnitude of the gradient at 1, negative 1. So we really need this part anyway if we're going to be answering the question about the rate of greatest increase. So let's go ahead and figure out the magnitude of del f at 1, negative 1. And so remember, that's just going to be the square root of this thing squared plus this thing squared. So we actually get 9 plus 9. That'll be the square root of 18. Also known as, if we pull out the square root of 9, that would be 3. So we would actually get 3 root 2 for this. So our actual direction, we'll say the direction, is actually going to be, if we take this vector and divide it by this, we'll actually get negative 1 over root 2 comma positive 1 over root 2. So that's our direction of greatest increase. The rate of greatest increase is going to be this 3 root 2. We have our direction and our rate of greatest increase. So that's the answer for the first one. Now let's look at the second one and think conceptually. So if I'm standing at a point on the surface and I face this direction, then this is how steep it is going up that direction. Not for very far, just at the exact point P where I'm looking, at 1, negative 1. If I turn around and face the exact other direction, I would actually be going, looking down this exact same rate down the hill. Maybe not for very far, but right at the point P, right at 1, negative 1 instantaneously, I would be looking down at the same rate. So if that's the case, then we have our answer for part two as well. The direction of greatest decrease would be in the opposite direction. So our direction would actually be positive one over root two, comma negative one over root two. This is just our gradient multiplied by a scalar of negative one, opposite signs for the components here, right? Opposite direction. Now our rate of greatest decrease, if it's a rate of decrease, it should be a negative rate. We get the same rate, just a negative rate, so our rate of decrease is going to be negative 3 root 2. If we now think about our third one here, a direction of no change, let's think about what's happening. If I'm on some point 1, negative 1, and that's on some level curve. And to have no change, I would need to stay on whatever level curve the point one negative one is on. Remember that the gradient is going to point 
perpendicular or normal to this level curve here in an increasing direction. So what I'll need is just a way to move along the level curve here. In other words, I need to move in a direction that is perpendicular or orthogonal to the gradient. So what we want to think about is how do we move orthogonal to the gradient? And if you remember something about orthogonal vectors, how we tell if vectors are orthogonal, we want their dot product to be zero. So if I have the gradient and some other vector orthogonal, that means their dot product should be zero. So I should have some vector v that makes a dot product with negative one over root two comma positive one over root two. That should give me a dot product of zero. So I need to figure out what works in here to make that happen. Now we can't use the zero vector. The zero vector either has no direction or it has every direction depending on how you look at it. So we want a specific vector here. One thing that's really nice I think in looking at these, I mean the values are, are a little bit more complicated than whole numbers, but these are really the same thing just opposite signs, right? So if I put a 1 and a 1 here, doesn't that work? I'd have 1 times this plus 1 times this, and those would add up to 0 because we get opposite signs, right? So actually 1 comma 1 does point in an orthogonal direction to the gradient. So this would be a direction of no change. Now remember when we ask for a direction vector though, most people will want that as a unit vector. So what we'll need to do is say, well, if v is 1, 1, and that's a direction of no change, if we want a direction vector, if we want to change it to a unit vector, we want to change it to something like v hat, right? So what we'll need to do is take our vector 1, 1, and we'll actually need to divide it by its own magnitude. Magnitude here is easy though. The square root of x squared plus y squared, so we get the square root of 1 plus 1, which of course is just going to be 2 there in the root. So we actually get 1 over root 2 comma 1 over root 2. Coming up next in our Calculus 3 series, we have a video on directional derivatives and using knowledge about the gradient to find rates of change in any direction we want. Thanks for watching everybody. We hope to see you in that video.